Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. As you're making your travel plans, I do want to encourage you to go to johnnydollarair.com first. johnnydollarair.com is our Priceline affiliate link, so you get all the benefits of going through Priceline.com. Uh, such as being able to name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more, or being able to choose from great published rates, uh, but at no additional cost to you, and it helps the uh, program out. So go to johnnydollarair.com. All right, I do want to go ahead and just let you know, if you haven't noticed, my voice is a bit off. Uh, dealing with uh, something could be a sinus infection, um, but... Uh, just bear with us. Uh, vo not in the best voice, but I think good enough to record. So, uh, uh, just uh, uh, so let's get into today's program. The original air date is March the seventh, nineteen fifty, and the title is Alec Jefferson, the Youthful Millionaire. Johnny Dollar. Bob Douglas, Mike, Johnny. How soon can you leave? California. Right away. My right big toe needs the frosting. What's the matter? A policyholder. A young fellow named Jefferson went west on an oil deal and he's disappeared. It might be murder. Well, I guess I'd better pack two shirts. Looking for one man in a big state like California can be murder. Edmund O'Brien in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Great Corinthian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during process of search for your missing policyholder youthful millionaire Alec Jefferson, or how they were drilling for oil, but what they struck was me. <laughs> Expense account item one, $186.13, airfare, Hartford to Los Angeles. Item two, $15, hire car, airport to office of Rebel Wildcatters Incorporated on potential oil land in the New Hall Sorgus District. I arrived at 9.30 a.m., a handful of dirt dentists were hard at it, drilling at a rig not 30 feet from the shack-type office. Better stand by, driver. My man may not be here. Morning. Can you tell me where I'll find Mr. Flaherty? You're talking to him? I'm Mars Flaherty. What can I do for you? My name is Johnny Dollar, Mr. Flaherty. Yeah. I've been sent out here by the Corinthian Life Insurance Company to see if I can get a track on your partner, Alec Jefferson. I see. Well, if they have money you're spending, Dollar, so I don't care much if you waste it. But if you don't mind my saying so, I do think you're going to be wasting your time. Well, I get paid by the day. <laughs> then I guess you don't mind wasting time. Uh, oh, look, don't get the idea I'm just naturally pessimistic. I'm not. It's just that I've already done a lot of looking for young Jefferson, and when that bird flew to coop, he didn't leave a feather you could trace him by. Well, do you have any objection to giving me a few details? No, no, no. Sit down. Not at all. Thank you. To save time, maybe I'd better tell you what I already know. Well, it can't be much. It isn't. I suppose you realize Corinthian Life is the administrator of Jefferson's father's estate. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Well, having charge of the money, they naturally know that young Jefferson financed this operation. That's right. His money, my experience. The only thing we needed was a little more luck. Well, there you have it. That's all I've got. What can you tell me? That whatever young Alexander got, he was asking for. For a guy built like a... Cream puff. He got mighty strong around here. Around an oil field, that isn't healthy even for a big guy. How do you mean, he got strong? Too much money, too much opinion. That mixed up with too many other men's women can mean trouble for anybody. Any particular women? 
Too many. Mind telling me who they are? No. Matter of fact, I... I got a list right here. Yeah, you, you can have it. I already tried it. Just one more thing. Yeah? How and when did he drop out of sight? A week ago last night. Yeah, he left here at 5 o'clock for his apartment on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. He never got there. I, I checked that, too. Here. Yeah. yeah. Now, give me that paper of facts for a minute. I'll write down the address. Thanks. Well, I'll be around. Oh, by the way, the, the first thing we try to figure out in my racket is who would benefit most. How would you like to have him found, dead or alive? Either way, Dollar. I can take it. I've lost partners before. I spent the next 20 minutes on a long shot, thinking I could pick up some information from the drillers. But it was a long shot that missed. Those guys wouldn't have told me it was a nice day. The outdoor life having got me nowhere, I decided to give the indoor type a try. First stop, Jefferson's apartment on the Sunset Strip. The lock was foolproof. But I wasn't fooling. The joint was decorated in a lovely shade of hangover green. A series of alcohol rings from the bottoms of glasses carrying out the motif on all flat surfaces. In the living room, I found several pieces of loosely strewn feminine attire. In the bedroom, I found one piece of loosely strewn female. Hey, who are you? What do you want? Oh, sorry. I understood this was Alec Jefferson's apartment. It is? Oh. You can drop your eyebrows, mister. I'm his wife. I beg your pardon? You heard me. I'm Mrs. Alec Jefferson. Let's see that robe, will you? Got to make coffee? Yeah, why? Well, how about making me some while I go put on a face? I guess so. You'll probably have to wash the percolator. To me, the best grounds for divorce would be coffee grounds and an unwashed percolator. So I washed it. I also made the coffee, wondering the while how she had made the matrimonial grade. Right then and there, I'd have given her the bad housekeeping award. She looked like the kind of a girl who could get into a beauty contest, but... (laughs) Like she'd never win it. Any way you looked at her, she was a new complication. Your coffee's ready. Find any clean cups? No, but I washed two. Here. Thanks. Now, would you mind telling me who you are? I'm an insurance investigator. I'm looking for your husband. I wish you'd find him. I could use some money. How long have you two been married? A few weeks. Why? Routine question. Tell me, when was the last time you saw him? I was waiting here for him the night he disappeared. Any witnesses? If I need them. Okay. Tell me this. Do you have any idea why he disappeared or where he is? At the slightest. Do you know a man named Morris Flaherty? Yeah. Yeah, I sure do. How well? I was his girl. So? By the way, have the police come to you yet? No, I went to them. You see, I'm the one who reported Alec missing. You know whether they've come up with anything? Nothing much. Up until now, he's just a missing person. They put Alex's picture on a television every night. I don't know that they're doing much else. They keep calling him a... a Caucasian. Look, look, please don't get so hysterical about this. It makes you so hard to question. Huh? Oh, nothing. Oh, oh, I get it. Excuse me if I seem dense this morning. Morning? Morning? It's 3 in the p.m. All right, so everything about me's wrong. That's right. Look, you can think that I married him for his money if you want to. Because you're used to suspecting everybody of everything. But have you heard? There are two sides to every marriage. Do I look strong enough to have carried him to the altar? I never weighed him. But answer me this. If he swept you off your feet, why did he pull a fade out in the middle of the honeymoon? What should I know? Maybe he'd never seen a dame without makeup on before and had to go someplace to think it out. I wonder if there's anything to eat. 
I'm hungry. Look, I, I think I'd better be going. I'm not much of a cook. When you're working on a case, your nerve ends are easily disturbed. So when I left the house and saw a hard-top blue Plymouth parked opposite the, the apartment, mine clanged an alarm. In the car sat an equally hard-top man reading holes in a newspaper. I gave him the slow walk away and quick turn treatment. And I caught him with his newspaper down. Then I had to go into my act. Why, George, you old son of a gun. Huh? Oh, my gosh, it's good to see you. What are you talking about? My name ain't George. What? What? Well, I'll be... What you know, as I came out of the house, I got half a look at you, and as I started to walk away, the face registered. Why, mister, you're a dead ringer for an old school pal of mine, George Pfeiffer. How do you like that? Look, come here, let me take a closer look. Come here. All right, look out. Sleep tight. Oh. Okay, Sleeping Beauty, over you go. I'll drive. I turned the car up into the Hollywood Hills, found an empty house with a for sale sign out front, and a garage out back and drove in. His wallet was bulging with everything but money and information. An ID card gave his name as Philip Wilkins, his occupation as private detective. The next fact I came up with was that Mr. Wilkins was a light sleeper. He came, too, to find me still fishing through his wallet. Oh, hey, hey, give me that. Okay, hold it, mister. Take it easy. Here, you can have your wallet back. Yeah. Now, keep calm and everything's going to be all right. If you don't, I'll have to give your whiskers another dusting. Oh, look, what's a big idea? What'd you slug me for? You know why, Mr. Wilkins. Because you had a plant on me, and I figured if you were that curious about me, I wanted to know more about you. You're nuts. I wasn't watching you. I was watching that house you come out of. There's a dame in there, and I'm getting paid to tell. I can't afford to be convinced of that. Who hired you? I'm not telling. You or anybody else, Mr. Dollar. Oh, word travels fast. First you tell me you're not watching me, then you also tell me you know who I am. So what? Is that illegal? You went to see the thing that I'm watching. I was told you'd probably be around, and you was. You'll be in my report. If you're healthy enough to make it. What were you really doing with that stakeout? Were you watching the apartment, waiting for somebody to show up? Do you really have a tail on Mrs. Jefferson? Or did you follow me in from the oil fields? Why should I follow you? Maybe you and I got the same uh, approach to this case. You found him yet? No, but it's still early. Who else is interested in finding Jefferson? I hear he's quite a playboy. Maybe one of his playmates wants him served with breach of promise papers. Come on, Donald, let's face it. I can't tell you who I'm working for. You know that. It ain't ethical. It's not ethical to let yourself get picked up as easily as I picked you up either. But let it go. I don't suppose by any chance you know a man named Mars Flaherty. No. I'd like to see one of his derricks fall on him. Why so? What did he do to you? A couple of days ago, I went out there to try and sell him some information. He had three of his men beat me up and throw me off the oil field. Yeah? What's with that look? Would you believe me? Who knows? You might be telling me you hate Mars Flaherty to keep me from thinking you're working for him. I think you better get out of this car and let me drive away, Dollar. You're in a lot of trouble. I don't think so. Oh, you don't think so? I can have you pulled in for kidnapping. If that's what you have in mind, then first you'd better get a few witnesses for yourself. Now, come on, suppose you calm down for a minute. If you really hate that guy, well, maybe we can make a deal. It's against him, I'll deal with him. How much do you know about Flaherty? My bookies mark lousy from way back. He's promoted about 50 wells and none of them ever happened. He's wild to hit oil. It's my guess that he's got a hunch that this is the big one. That's why I think his partner disappeared. Yeah, what difference would that make? Even if his partner turned up dead, Flaherty would still have to split any profits with young Jefferson's estate. Maybe not. I know they had a queer deal. Well, who'd know about that deal besides Flaherty and Jefferson? I don't know. But I do know one way of finding out what it is. How's that? Flaherty keeps all his papers in the safe in his office. I've even got the combination. We'll give it to you. You keep it. Wilkins, I still don't know who you're trying to get even with, Flaherty or me. So what I'm going to do is give you half a break. Then I'll only be taking half a chance. Yeah, then why don't you want the combination to the safe? I don't need it. You're going to open that safe. 
Because you're going out there with me. Tonight. Here. This window. Okay. Now, here. You handle a glass cutter. Right. Now, look. Here's what we do. I'll wet this suction cup. Get a grip on the glass, eh? Now, nah, you cut around the outside edge and I'll lift the paint out in one piece. Lesson number one, straight from the burglar's handbook. Get your fingers over that flashlight. For all I know, you might still turn out to be the local poor of the year. Yeah, that's right. I might. Here. You hold a light. Thanks, I will. Go on, get to work. All right, all right. I'm as anxious to get this over with as you are. Right, give me a little more light, will Okay. There you are. All right, go to it. Uh-uh. You go to it. You reach in. And if your hand comes up with anything heavier than papers, I'll cream your skull. Will you stop your worrying? Here. Nothing here. Nothing here. Ah, no. All right, you got him, that's all. Stay down there. I don't want to walk off with anybody's government bonds. Here. I got all I want. We'll put these back. All right. Now, close it up. All right, now, come on. Let's get out of here. Just a minute, Wilkins. I'm going to have a good look at these papers. You can look at them later. Come on, let's go. Look, this I'll give you for free. And it's the difference between being a $4 a day private detective and a $10 one. What you've got printed in your memory, nobody can take away from you. So hold your horses while I take a look at this partnership agreement. All right, all right. But hurry up, will you? I've got a couple of watchmen around here. Yeah, here it is. Okay, let's go. You first. Okay, back to the car. Make it fast and easy. Get in. Over here. You drive. Yeah. You know, Wilkins... I had a clammy feeling for a while back there that, that we weren't going to make it. Don't go starting any celebrations. You didn't make it. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, Cooper and Yuffley, Johnny Dollar to Bing... Gary Cooper and Young Gary this Wednesday. Now we return to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Edmund O'Brien. There I was, wearing a gun muzzle for a back collar button. My left leg picked up the nervous vibrations of my front seatmate, Philip Wilkins. Mars Flaherty in the back seat was so close I could almost identify the brand of the bourbon he'd been drinking. I suppose you got what you went into the office after. Huh? I not only got it, I memorized it. And it makes you look bad. Yeah, well, then I don't have to explain to you why I don't want you two guys or the paper running around town on the loose. Well, it's a corporate paper. That means it's on file somewhere. So what difference does it oh, make? God, start the car. Where are we going? To my house. Go ahead. Get going. Okay, Wilkins, you better roll. What's at your house? 
The reason that paper makes a difference right now. The guy you came here looking for showed up. Alec Jefferson, where is he? Uh, he's where we're going. My place. Well, then I guess maybe my employers have got nothing to worry about. Nothing but paying off on his life insurance. Alec Jefferson's dead. Here. Here, Dollar, here's the key. Open the door. Stand next to him, Wilkins. Close. Uh, the, uh, the light switch is on your right. There's your boy, Dollar. Died young, didn't he? Uh, the thing is, it looks like he died in my house. Now, what do I do now? If you're putting on an innocent act, you're doing pretty good, Flaherty. How's the rest of it go? Uh, uh, I've been around killings before, so I know how the rest of it goes. <laughs> the cops take one look at this, they grab me, and before that happens, I got some work to do. So have I been around killings before. And I know how the rest of your story goes. You came into your house and you found him. Somebody hit Jefferson over the head with that piece of firewood to get rid of him and make you look guilty. You're being framed. Uh -huh. The next chapter reads, you've got eight witnesses... To prove you were at a church social at the probable time of death. Ah, that's the way I wish it read, but I haven't got any witnesses. I've been on the loose out in the hills ever since I saw you this morning. Oh, yeah? What are you, a nature lover? An oil man. In my racket, you never stop sniffing. When I came back and found him here, I, I headed it for the office. I, I wanted that paper you got out of the way for the time being. Would that gun of yours object if I looked the body over? <laughs> Help yourself. Thank you. Any idea how long he's been dead, Dollar? Oh, hard to tell. Feels like quite a while. Could have happened before I met you. What do you mean by that? Nothing. Hey, uh, Flaherty. Huh? You ever see this before? What is it? An earring. No, let me see that. Here, hands off. Don't touch it. That's another four-dollar detective move. You don't touch evidence. You draw a mental picture of it. What are you trying to do, involve yourself or uninvolve a client? How about it, Flaherty? Do you have any idea who that earring belongs to? Maybe one of the dames on that list you gave me, huh? I wish I could get away with lying to you, Dollar, but I don't think I'm in a position to try. It belongs to Ada. Oh, Jefferson's wife. Not legally. What do you mean? I married her in Mexico in 45. <laughs> she must have liked the scenery. She took Jefferson down there and went through a ceremony with him two weeks ago. Without divorcing you? That's right. You guys really turned out to be partners. Now, about that earring. How do you know it belongs to Ada? Well, it's one of a set I bought for her about six months ago. Well, I might as well tell you. They'd find out anyway. Uh-huh. Well... I don't suppose you're in the mood to let me do what I want to do. What's that? Call the police. No, no, not yet. Well, I'll tell you one thing. With this piece of evidence that just turned up, you're wasting your time holding on to us. What you should be doing is getting to Ada before she flies the coop. That would really fix you up. <laughs> sure would. I don't want to see her get loose any more than you do. Then I guess we better go pay Ada a visit. is one lousy earring, and if you think I'm going to stand here and listen to you try to pin a murder on me, you're nuts. Mars never bought me anything. He never gave me any earrings. How about it, Flaherty? Uh, too bad, Ada. If I thought there was a chance to help you, I would. But your earring was laying right there on the floor next to his body. Why, you oily monster, you. What are you trying to do to me? Why, if anybody had reason to kill Alec, you did, you miserable thief. Now, now, wait a minute, Ada. Don't make yourself look worse by throwing a lot of accusations around. I know about the contract between Alec and Mars. In case of death, the survivor gains full control of the oil field. But a good piece of evidence will beat out a good piece of motive in any court in the country, and you've got both working against you. Get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. I think I do. Knowing about that agreement, you married both these guys. 
Those Mexican marriages are just just weak enough to help you beat a bigamy rap if it came to that, and just strong enough to help you collect if either of your husbands died. Your next move would be to divorce the one that was still living and take advantage of the California community property laws. Oh, you've got it all figured out, haven't you? Well, not quite. I haven't figured out why young Jefferson went to all the trouble of dropping out of sight and then showed up to get himself murdered. I think I can tell you. Well, it's about time you told us something. I was working for Alec Jefferson. That's why I couldn't tell you, Donna. I was getting paid to help him stay out of sight and keep my eye on these two. The contract had him worried. But when I uncovered the bigamy and told him about it, he decided to go to Flaherty and try and straighten it out, man-to-man basis. You know that, Ada? No. I don't know anything about anything. That's a lie. I was with him this morning when he called you. He told you he was going out there. You had plenty of time to get out there and wait for him. You can't get away with it. You can't prove anything. Now get out of here! Not before. I don't mind that gun, Flaherty. I got it. No, let me go. Hey, hey, none of that. Around you go. That's better. Yeah, much better. Now, come on, Angel, across the road. Well, Flaherty... Don't you think I'd better call the police now? Well, I'm afraid there's nothing else to do. Okay, then you hold it. You put your hands up. Come on. You dirty fucking... Oh, you... Get me police, operator. My name is Dollar. I'm calling from apartment 3C, Horizon View Apartment, Sunset Strip. I've got a murderer here for you. It's out in Newhall, but that can wait. Well, dead bodies usually do, but you never can tell about a killer. Well, that's it. You got a good tight hold on her, Flaherty? Yeah, I can handle it. Good. Then handle this. Ah! Are you nuts? What'd you do that for? I wanted to keep him on ice till the police get here. Mars Flaherty is our boy. What? Come here, Ada. What is it? Wilkins? Take a look at her ears. What? I don't see nothing wrong with them. Well, that's just it. That earring we found near the body, it was made for a pierced ear. Ada's aren't. She never could have worn it. Moral? If Flaherty had been a nice enough guy to buy jewelry for his wife when he had her, he wouldn't have bought the wrong kind of earring when he wanted to set her up as a patsy. The police traced his purchase of same to a Main Street pawn shop. But what really nailed him was the biggest switch of all. Since the murder weapon was a shaft of rough bark firewood, there were no fingerprints on it. But by the same token, there were weapon prints on Flaherty's fingers. A batch of tiny splinters under the skin. And as much as my own girl furnished the practice which made me perfect on this case, I assume you will not be annoyed at my listing expense account item three, sixty-five dollars, one pair gold earrings inscribed to Olga with love. Item four, a hundred and eighty-seven dollars and thirteen cents return transportation Los Angeles to Hartford. Expense account total. Seven hundred and eleven dollars signed yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Harry M. Popkin United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Ed Max, and Tony Barrett. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Be sure to join us next Tuesday evening when Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar.
blizzards in the western states, floods in Texas, hurricanes in Florida, tornadoes in Louisiana. Wherever disaster strikes, the American Red Cross stands ready to lend assistance. The Red Cross helps victims not only at the terrifying moment when disaster strikes, but also in rehabilitation. This is just one of the many nationwide activities of the Red Cross. Give generously to its latest drive. Now stay tuned for the adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follows immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure next Tuesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. I did love that pre-commercial surprise with the partner showing up in the back of the car. We also get to hear a bit of Johnny kind of throwing off on a detective who doesn't really know what he's doing, which is a bit of an interesting concept for the show. Well, now on to listener comments and feedback, and we have this from John, who writes, when it comes to investigating a murder, Johnny Dollar is just an expert, but when it comes to being a bodyguard, he's great at investigating the murder. Uh, yeah, that does bring up an interesting point. We do know that eventually when he gets into the Bailey era, he gets to spend more time actually uh, serving as bodyguard. I then received uh, this tweet from Ian who writes, I've really been enjoying the Jack Moyles episodes of Rocky Jordan. His Bogart-like delivery is perfect for this Casablanca series. I wonder what the circumstances were behind George Raff taking over the role. And we'll address that particular part uh, when we get to those, which will be a little less than two weeks away. Uh, he says, um, it reminds me of Edmund O'Brien taking over from Charles Russell's Johnny Dollar. Much as I like O'Brien on screen, Russell was better in the Dollar role. Did Russell get bumped in favor of the higher profile O'Brien, or was he leaving anyway? Well, uh, to be honest, from everything I've seen, um, I don't have a definitive answer, but most fan sources tend to assume that Russell was pushed out, and kind of uh, with uh, reason, because in many ways it wasn't even a uh, well-remembered era at all, and the show went in a different direction. You know, if they just wanted to have a radio series starring Edmund O'Brien, you know, they could have uh, done that. They've certainly given Lesser Stars a uh, series on CBS. Um, and uh, Russell's era was very little uh, remembered. Uh, I'm part of an old-time radio group, and they posted a newspaper article on the return of Johnny Dollar from 1955, and the reporter had in there that uh, the role was originally written for Edmund O'Brien. And they mentioned John Lund, didn't mention Russell at all. So I think it's safe to say that Russell didn't make that connection with the, uh, the modern audience of 1949. He's since connected with uh, some of the uh, current audiences uh, better. But uh, I think that uh, it was... It was just not working for CBS with uh, Russell, uh, regardless of his talents as an actor. This wasn't what CBS wanted, and so they made a change. Well, that will do it for today. I want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Mike, Patreon supporter since July 2015, currently supporting us at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Mike. And that will do it for now. Join us back tomorrow for Dragnet next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.